Well, good, good evening, everybody, and it's a, a pleasure to be here this evening and have a chance to uh, address you. So I want to take the opportunity tonight to talk to you about the future. We live in peaceful, yet very turbulent uh, times politically. So what are the present realities and challenges we face, and what does the future hold for the North? In April, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, and this, despite um, all of our ongoing challenges, gave us the time to stop and to reflect on what has been achieved over the past two decades. And the entire island of Ireland has been transformed as a result of the peace process, where we've emerged from decades of political conflict and towards a more prosperous, peaceful and democratic society, of which the Great Friday Agreement of 1998 is the very foundation stone. The agreement was reached after the IRS cessation of 1994, which resulted in multi-party negotiations forming the basis of a political agreement between the Irish and British governments and between the parties. The agreement received overwhelming endorsement in referenda that was held north and south. The agreement provided an end to conflict and provided a peaceful and democratic alternative and a huge, huge opportunity for us all to design a better society for ourselves and for future generations to live. The declaration by the parties at the start of the agreement says, we are committed to partnership, equality and mutual respect as the basis of relationships within Northern Ireland, between North and South and between these islands. When I reflect back to that time as a 21 year old living in County Tyrone, where we had endured a long conflict, grown up under British military occupation, witnessed firsthand the heartache of family and friends and neighbours being killed, I recall the year of 1998 being one that had optimism and was a time filled with hope. This was what motivated me to become active in politics and public life and a desire to help build and shape the new future and the opportunities that were before us. Having served in the Assembly alongside Unionists and those of a different cultural, religious and political tradition as myself, I inevitably formed friendships with people on a human level and political partnerships whilst working together to improve and deliver public services and a better quality of life for the people that we collectively represented. That partnership and that friendship was no more epitomised in the relationship between the late Ian Paisley and the late Martin McGuinness while serving together in 2007 as First and Deputy First Ministers. After a turbulent number of years, from 98 to 2007, of the Assembly being up and down, this period from 2007 once again gave a renewed sense of hope. There was a sense that these once arch opponents had come together and led us over the threshold into a new era, and were making good on promises given in working with each other in good faith. As the new Vice President of Sinn Féin, I want us to keep that faith. I want to keep us to keep faith with the hope, drive change and get us back to rebuilding partnership and friendship in a working assembly and an executive which allows us to open the door and let the future in. I truly and passionately believe that we need to get back to the letter and to the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement. It was and remains a precious gift of peace to our young people and it is absolutely indispensable. But I also recognise that peace alone is no longer good enough for this new generation, who rightly demand to be afforded civil, social, economic and cultural rights in the year 2018, which are taken for granted and routine elsewhere on these islands, but are unjustly denied here. Much has changed and been achieved since the civil rights campaign of 1998, but to think that any minority, any minority group, or any group at all in 2018 still has to fight for basic rights, including women, LGBT, Irish speakers, ethnic minorities, is simply not sustainable. It is unjust in this modern era. I won't rehearse the past um, 21 months of political breakdown and deadlock, deal or no deal, because I want to focus tonight on resolutions rather than recrimination. But while we are accustomed to crisis, to disappointments and setbacks in this part of the world, it is imperative that we arrest the political drift that we are currently in and that we stop the attempts to unravel the Good Friday Agreement and its political institutions before it becomes unsalvageable. Clearly that is a monumental challenge, otherwise it will be done already. 
There is no way of escaping the two present realities and challenges which are undermining any attempt to restore the executive at this time. The first is the unwanted Brexit. This has been imposed against the wishes and the best interests of the people here. The second is the DUP and Tory confidence and supply arrangement at Westminster, where Theresa May's government is wholly reliant on the DUP to stay in power, and therefore prioritising this self-serving agenda over the peace and the political processes here. And both of these realities are putting at risk our hard-won peace. This deal with the DUP robbed Theresa May and her government of any pretense whatsoever of impartiality in the negotiations for the restoration of the North's political institutions. The idea that her government could act as an honest broker whilst being beholden to the DUP stretches credibility to beyond breaking point. Karen Bradley, as British Secretary of State, disgracefully moved to suspend her powers calling to call for a future Assembly election because the courts were likely to go in to force her to do so. And she disguised this by, in tandem, cutting MLA pay, something which we said she should do a long time ago. So why has she done this? Because the DUP didn't want to face a court-ordered election while the RHI inquiry is running, as they're exposed for incompetence, dysfunctionality, and allegations of financial malpractice by the day. At this time, it is my absolute firm assessment that Karen Bradley has no plan to do anything to constructively aid the restoration of the Assembly. The Sinn Féin leadership met with Theresa May and Karen Bradley on Monday of this week, and we told them in plain terms that this is exactly the case. It is therefore the duty and the responsibility of the Irish Government, who are co-guarantors of the agreement and the peace process, to hold the British Government to their responsibilities. And through the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference, which will meet in a number of weeks in Dublin, insist that together they arrest this situation of stasis and agree to remove the obstacles to restoring the executive. This can be done, this should be done, and this must be done without delay. This in itself could pave the way for a new executive. What nationalism expects to see is that the equality, the mutual respect, and all Ireland approaches enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement are fully embraced by the DUP. That the negative attitude and disrespect to Irish national identity and culture is consigned to the past. That those who wish to live their lives through the medium of Irish language can do so and have protection before the law. The prejudice that's felt by women, the LGBT community and ethnic minorities not only stops but is prevented by government rather than facilitated. The public deserve to have functioning, a functioning government and one in which they can have confidence in. I would also be I would find it hard, I would imagine, to find anyone inside or outside of this room who does not believe that reform of how the Assembly and the Executive and our public body politic operates is a necessity and not a choice. Every government, no matter where you go, wrestles with difficult and complex challenges, and we are no different. But the basic norms of power sharing, party of esteem, and principles of the Good Friday Agreement must be accepted and embraced by everyone in order for us to succeed. So what does that mean? This means discharging our duties in good faith. It means serving all the people equally. It means preventing discrimination, promoting the interests of the whole community, upholding our commitment to genuine power sharing, respect and mutual trust towards one another. It means actively promoting reconciliation and building bridges we can all cross to end sectarianism and bigotry at every level of society. I certainly want an assembly that operates differently from what went before and to usher in a new kind of politics which is progressive, respectful and has integrity. Public confidence must be earned and trust must be rebuilt if the assembly and the executive is going to have any kind of credibility. Any new executive should, in my view, be an inclusive partnership coalition government. Never ever again can we see the scandals like Red Sky, NAMA and RHA happen in this place. This is totally unacceptable and unethical behaviour. We need civil service reforms and proper checks and balances too. With the civil service's role has been in contributing to the RHA debacle, nobody doubts that it has a critical role in ensuring that, it is never, that there is never a repeat and therefore we must look at serious reforms. 
We need ministers who are competent to do their jobs. We need legislative reform to ensure that special advisors operate in an accountable and lawful fashion if we are to uphold the highest standards in public office. We need open government where decisions on, on how they are taken and in whose interests are laid bare and properly scrutinised day and daily with no hiding place for any risk of malpractice or cronyism. So can this be done? Yes, of course it can. We all need to know that if we're going to re-enter talks, that those participating have the will to reach agreement, have the mandate and the authority to actually take decisions and know what it is that they're looking for because each party brings their own issues and every party has issues which they want to see resolved. Progress is and always has been possible. If there is a political will, then there is surely always a way. Brexit was not our choice and it is unwanted by the majority of people and the majority of parties here in the North. There is no good to come from Brexit for Ireland, North or for South. Throughout all of our peace process, the European Union has been a critical partner for peace, providing substantial political and financial aid, which has led to a greater economic and social progress on an all-island basis. The Brexit crisis is deepening. It is unprecedented, it's chaotic, and how it will pan out is unpredictable to everyone at this stage. As the Brexit negotiations enter the final critical phase, outstanding issues remain to be resolved not least the question of the Irish backstop and the nature of future relationships between Britain and the European Union. If a deal is reached, there remain a number of challenges to overcome, including obtaining the consent of the Westminster Parliament for any deal. So these issues raise profound questions, not only for the North of Ireland and the EU, but also for the future of the Union itself. The majority of MLAs elected are anti-Brexit and we are collectively mandated to defend the North's interest. The DUP, in terms of Brexit, are isolationists and on the wrong side of the argument and the democratic will of the people here who voted to remain. They support Brexit at any cost of imposing a hard border or, as Nelson McCausland said, Brexit at any cost. Arlene Foster insists that the DUP will not accept a deal that introduces new regulatory difference between the North and Britain and that this is a red line, that this red line is a blood red line for the DUP. We have to avoid economic apartheid on this island and a hard border. Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, has said the checks are unavoidable if the erection of a physical border is to be prevented, and that the EU wishes to make them not too burdensome, in particular for smaller businesses. He says that their proposals limit itself to what is absolutely necessary to avoid that hard border customs procedures and the respect for EU standards for products. It does not include measures on free movement of EU citizens, services, healthcare or social and environmental policy, but it gives the North of Ireland benefits that no other third country enjoys, including access to the EU single market for goods and continued benefit from EU free trade arrangements and the continuation of the single electricity market. The proposed backstop is a safety net and it's an insurance policy. The common travel area, in the event of a Brexit deal or none, will continue to allow British and Irish citizens only in Britain and on the island of Ireland associated rights and entitlements, including access to employment, healthcare, education, social benefits, as well as the right to vote in certain elections. Brexit cannot be considered to be an orange and green issue, and I think there's considerable merit in us all looking at post-Brexit rights and entitlements through a new lens. There is obvious value in a Bill of Rights for the North that's been referred to, or that was referred to in the Good Friday Agreement, in its ability to mitigate the potential rights impacts of Brexit. There is also value in a Charter of Rights for the whole of the island, as referred to in the Good Friday Agreement. This would allow support, also support the provision in the agreement on equivalence of rights on the island. We, along with the SDLP, the Alliance and the Greens, want the North to remain within the customs union and the single market. We want to preserve the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts, protect human rights and together make clear that the backstop is the bottom line to protect our future economic stability. Together we met EU Chief Negotiator Michel Barnier as the majority voice for the people here and he assured us that the backstop would apply unless and until another solution is found. Checkers fails to offer another solution 
and Michelle Barnier has been crystal clear on that. We as a party are arguing for the North to receive special economic status within the EU. A special status relationship outside of the EU would do little to deal with the massive political, social and economic challenges thrown up by Brexit. As a former agriculture minister, I'm acutely aware of the critical importance of the agri-food sector to our economy and it's uniquely vulnerable to the loss of EU funding and the potential tariff and non-tariff barriers for trade. For example, almost 30% of the North's milk is processed in the South, which also receives 40% of our live lamb exports. So we all know that Brexit poses major challenges to agriculture, but also to the manufacturing, to the retail sector, hospitality, higher education, tourism, energy, all sectors will be negatively impacted. We also know that the fluctuating euro sterling exchange rate will be compounded if there are additional trade tariff costs imposed on businesses which some firms could find it impossible to keep trading. Impacts on trade and employment and the need for competitiveness and innovation are all amplified. When trying to attract investors, we talk about our strategic lo location to British and European markets. We talk about our skilled workforce. We talk about our competitive operating costs, our advanced infrastructure. And these things are now all at risk because of Brexit. The EU helps fund much of what we take for granted. To retain our economic competitiveness, we cannot incur, incur additional trade costs and we need to retain access to labour and skills. I firmly believe that we need to develop and nurture and build and grow the all-island economy where we can develop closer regimes and models of integration. In light of Brexit, it's imperative that the island of Ireland redoubles our efforts to develop and rebuild a modern, competitive and sustainable economy where we open up doors to trade, investment, tourism and jobs, but also develop and invest in our indigenous, indigenous industries. We need to improve the competitiveness through investing in public services and in infrastructure. And the EU support clearly helps us to do these things and brings massive economic and social benefits. These programmes are important, all the EU programmes are important drivers of regional development in a cross-border context and they allow for practical support of the peace process and the advancement of the Good Friday Agreement. One of the most obvious symbols of the peace process, the invisible border on the island of Ireland, and that is essential. Prior to the Good Friday Agreement, security checkpoints on the border, military installations, which have been built and reinforced from the 70s onwards, were symbols of division and conflict. The demilitarisation of physical border crossings and checkpoints is both a symbol of and a div dividend of uh, the success of the peace process. People's daily lives in the border regions have been transformed and any reversal will have huge adverse economic, social and political and security but also psychological impacts on people both in border communities and on the island of Ireland as a whole. Brexit represents the greatest economic threat to the island of Ireland in a generation. I fully respect the right of the British people to leave the EU and I wish them the very best. However, I am absolutely opposed to the British government dragging us out of the EU against our will. Sinn Féin have influenced and made our case to the EU27, in the Dáil and in the European Parliament. We will continue to make our voices heard and to build a progressive coalition around our national interests in the coming weeks ahead. With all of this going on, there's a growing sense that circumstances are rapidly changing which will inevitably lead to the breakup, the final breakup of the constitutional structures of the United Kingdom, which Theresa May and the DUP say they are committed to preserving. The Sinn Féin leadership met with the British Prime Minister and the British Secretary of State in London on Monday. We have made it clear that in the case of a Brexit crash out and in the case of a no deal scenario, that it's absolutely incumbent upon them to put the constitutional future to the people here through a unity referendum that was promised in the Good Friday Agreement. Their planned imposition of Brexit in Ireland once again demonstrates the failure of partition and exposes further the gaping demographic deficit inherent in a partitioned Ireland. People from across the society, and I believe even those with a British identity, are questioning what will be the merits and benefits of staying within the Union after Brexit. <clears throat> the EU has said that in the event of reunification, the whole of Ireland will be automatically subsumed back into the EU. So the debate about our constitutional future is underway. 
It's as much about our relationship with Europe as it is about our, our future Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement provides a peaceful and democratic pathway to Irish unity. And the issue of Irish unity has taken on that whole new dynamic because of Brexit. Demographics are changing, and so too is that political landscape. And this cannot be ignored. Peter Robinson's remarks here at Queen's University when he gave his own lecture back in June acknowledged this. The Good Friday Agreement gives people the opportunity and the choice to decide our future together. How we live together, how we work together, and how we share this island together. The political momentum on change is moving in that direction. Sinn Féin wants a new Ireland, a fairer Ireland, and a united Ireland, but we certainly don't claim to own the debate. I have absolutely no doubt that there are many people within the unionist community who look to Brexit with the same fear and the same trepidation as those from a nationalist and republican background. The unity referendum is coming and we need to be prepared for it. There's a duty on all of us to be prepared for it and all options must be on the table as we shape the future together. There is no contradiction whatsoever in, in delivering on our firm, firm commitment to power sharing with the unionism and a functional assembly whilst also initiating a mature and inclusive debate about a new political arrangements which serve us better. Similarly, there is no contradiction in unionism working the existing constitutional arrangements while taking its rightful place in the conversation about what a new Ireland could look like. It's time for us to hear all voices within this debate. So we must continue our journey of dialogue, of listening, of sharing ideas, because the new Ireland which we seek, that we speak of, there can only be victory for all of us. I want to thank you for taking the time to come here this evening and for listening to what I have to say. But I want to finish by saying this. The debate on our constitutional future threatens no one. There is not, so therefore, let's have it in a mature and in a rational manner. What has brought us together as a community, divided by identity and allegiance, has been the Good Friday Agreement. So let's defend it and not allow others to rip it or us apart and recognise that it is indispensable. Let's try and reinvent the optimism and the hope that we have all witnessed before by turning a corner, creating a new kind of politics which is democratic, energetic and progressive, which allows everyone irrespective of race, of identity, of uh, colour, of creed, of disability, gender or sexual orientation to feel that they belong. Let's get down to business and design a better society and an economy for ourselves and future generations to live in. A shared history does not mean a shared memory or even a shared experience of the past. But we can determine and we can create a shared future together. We can open doors and we can let the future in. We must give people hope and we must create opportunity for young people. This is the most defining period since the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. Change is happening. Dialogue is crucial. We need courage, not chaos. But most of all, we must choose hope over fear. Gormila Maiov. Sinn Féin, Gwananis Carta Agus Intas Naharan, Equality, Rights and Irish Unity.